Well, this is, of course, part of the fun and games of reading Thoreau. He loves to play around with the ancient stories, and he finishes with maybe an uh, English uh, uh, person named Saffron Walden showed up, and for one purpose or another, it was actually called the Walled Inn Pond. He says a few lines later, in summer, talking now about the temperature of the water. In the summer, Walden never becomes so warm as most water which is exposed to the sun on account of its depth. In the warmest weather, I usually placed a pailful in my cellar where it became cool in the night and remained so during the day, though I also resorted to a spring in the neighborhood. It was as good when a week old as the day it was dipped and had no taste of the pump. Whoever camps for a week in summer by the shore of a pond needs only bury a pail of water a few feet deep in the shade of his camp to be independent of the luxury of ice. We, of course, who live drinking um, beautiful water out of the bighorns, we can appreciate the quality of the water is what he's talking about. He says Walden produces remarkable water. He talks then a few lines later about the lake as the earth's eye. He says it this way, a lake is the landscape's most beautiful and expressive feature. It's earth's eye looking into which the beholder measures the depth of his own nature. The fervilled trees next to the shore are the slender eyelashes which fringe it, and the wooded hills and cliffs around are its overhanging brows. I'm reminded of what we've said in our conversations and study about uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley's defense of poetry, where you'll recall he said, and we've given these lectures elsewhere, he recall, you recall that he said, that great poets will make us see the uh, normal stuff in a brand new way. We, in our lecture on um, um, To a Skylark, we make this observation, right? Here, I think, Thoreau is playing a very similar kind of game. What is a pond? Well, it's like an eye. Of course, if you look at an actual eye and the way that the eye is constructed, in some very interesting ways, a pond is like an eye with a surface, with, of course, that rounded or concaved bottom to it. Beautiful. It's a beautiful way to think about, um, about the, the eye. And, of course, we cannot help but think about Emerson and his famous transparent eyeball in, this, in his essay, Nature, of course, Thoreau, who knew, knew that one well. To continuing to speak about the pond, he says uh, in, in a passage that really, I mean, this just reads like poetry. It's quite remarkable. He says, not a fish can leap or an insect fall on the pond, but it is thus reported in circling dimples and lines of beauty, as it were, the constant welling up of its fountain, the gentle pulsing of its life, the heaving of its breast, the thrills of joy and thrills of pain, he says, are indistinguishable. There's your, there's your theodicy um, uh, message, right? How peaceful the phenomena of the lake, and then he even uses a, an exclamation point. Again, he says, the works of man shine as in the spring. Aye, every leaf and twig and stone and cobweb sparkles now at mid-afternoon as when covered with dew in a spring morning. Every motion of an oar or an insect produces a flash of light, and if an oar falls, how sweet the echo, and then he uses again an exclamation point. In such a day, in September or October, Walden is a perfect forest mirror set round with stones as precious to my eye as if fewer or rarer. Now, this notion of, um, of nature being like a mirror uh, will sound very much like our comments from Aristotle's Poetics. You can go back and take a look at those observations. That is to say, Aristotle argues in Poetics, you go to watch a play performed on stage, you think the drama is happening on stage, and Aristotle says, no, 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 no. What's happening on stage is just the play. The drama is what's happening out in the audience. As the audience members look into the mirror of the play, you'll remember these comments as well in Shakespeare's Hamlet, where Hamlet will say the same thing to the actors before they perform. Looking into the mirror and then seeing themselves reflected back in some powerful way. We're going to play the same game here now with Walden. He says, he says it this way, Nothing so fair, so pure, and at the same time so large as a lake, perchance, lies on the surface of the earth. And then he calls it sky water. It's a beautiful word, right? It needs no fence. Nations come and go without defiling it. We would, of course, say, well, tragically, that's not always the case. It's a mirror which no stone can crack, whose quicksilver will never wear off, whose, guild, whose gilding nature continually repairs. No storms, no dust can dim, can dim its surface ever fresh. And again, tragically, we read these lines going, yeah, but a number of our ponds and rivers in America and elsewhere in the world have been destroyed, obviously, sadly, right? 
He says, a mirror in which all impurity presented to it sinks, swept and dusted by the sun's hazy brush, this the light dust cloth which retains no breath that it is breathed on it, but sends its own to float as clouds high above its surface and be reflected in its bosom still. A field of water, he says, betrays the spirit that is in the air. It's continually receiving new life and motion from above. It's intermediate in its nature between land and sky. In other words, remember what we said about how the Greeks saw the gods as immortal and, and, uh, and far more epistemologically aware. Men, of course, and women as being the opposite of that, mortal and unaware. And then in between, that intermediate. And this is what he's calling Walden Pond. That go between, what is that? Well, for the Greeks, it was their artists. It was their poets. And notice we're playing a very similar game here. He says, on land, only the grass and trees wave, but the water itself is rippled by the wind. I see where the breeze dashes across it by the streaks or flakes of light. It's remarkable that we can look down on its surface. We shall perhaps look down thus on the surface of air at length and mark where a still subtler spirit sweeps over it. Well, this is just beautiful poetry and, of course, what, what is a pond? Well, in many ways, it's the mirror uh, that allows one to see into the life of things is the way Wordsworth says it in Tintern Abbey. And of course, that seeing into the life of things is here as well what Thoreau wishes for us to be able to pay attention to as well. He continues a few lines later by saying, an old man, a potter who lived by the pond before the revolution, told me that once there was an iron chest at the bottom and that he had seen it. Sometimes it come floating up to the shore, but when you went toward it, it would go back, he says, into deep water and disappear. I was pleased to hear of the old log canoe that he's discussing, um, which took the place of an Indian one of the summer, uh, one of the same material, but more graceful construction, which perchance had first been a tree on the bank, and then, as it were, fell into the water to float there for a generation, the most proper vessel for the lake. He's commenting on the fact that around these ponds, sometimes you'll find old boats or whatever. He says, I remember that when I first looked into these depths, there were many large trunks to be seen, indistinctly lying on the bottom, which had either been blown over formally or left on the, uh, on the ice at the last cutting when wood was cheaper, but now they have mostly disappeared. Now notice the power of a poet to use the word trunk, because we have two meanings of trunk. Many will, of course, have read trunk to mean that which holds gold, silver, diamonds, or whatever, and every time you went towards it, it would, it would move away. Of course, here we're talking about tree trunks as well, and probably more importantly, tree trunks, right? It's a beautiful way to just remind us that Thoreau is always, as a poet, talking about more than one thing, which is why I love this, I love this chapter so much. He says, I've spent many an hour when I was younger, floating over its surface as the zephyr willed, having paddled my boat to the middle and lying on my back across the seats in a summer forenoon, dreaming awake, until I was aroused by the boat touching the sand, and I rose to see what shore my fates had impelled me to, days when idleness was the most attractive and productive industry. Many a forenoon have I stolen away, preferring to spend thus the most, the most valued part of the day, for I was rich, if not in money, in sunny hours, summer days, and spent them lavishly. Remember what he said before, a man is rich in proportion to the things he can live, live without, right? Nor do I regret that I did not waste more of them in the workshop or the teacher's desk. This will remind us, of course, of the end of Whitman's Song of the Open Road, My Not the Call of the Teacher, Get On Out There and Enjoy Your Life. But since I left those shores, the woodchoppers have still further laid them waste, talking about the trees now, and now for many a year, thou shalt be no more rambling through the aisles of the wood with occasional vistas through which you can see the water. He finishes this part by saying, My muse may be excused if she is silent henceforth. How can you expect the birds to sing when their groves are cut down? Now, I, some have argued this is the most beautiful line of the entire poem, Walden. Certainly, it's a challenging a rhetorical question. I'll read it again. How can you expect the birds to sing when their groves are cut down? Now, of course, we think of Rachel Carson in Silent Spring, and we've given a lecture already on that text, but notice here, can work on the literal and on the metaphoric level as well. He says about these trunks, now the trunks of trees on the bottom and the old log canoe and the dark surrounding woods are gone, and the villagers who scarcely know where it lies, instead of going to the pond to bathe or drink, 
are thinking to bring its water, which should be as sacred as the Ganges, at least, to the village in a pipe to wash their dishes with. Now, this is pure Thoreau, right? He's, he's like, really? This water is as precious as the Ganges, the, 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 the precious river of India, and you want to put a pipe from the town and bring this water to the town? He says, to earn their Walden by the turning of a cock or drawing of a plug. That devilish iron horse whose ear-rending neigh is heard throughout the town has muddled the boiling spring with his foot, and he it is that has browsed off all the woods on Walden shore, that Trojan horse. And again, I'll point out that it's like, it's like the Troy tale and the Iliad have been here with us all the time, or Virgil's Aeneid, we might even say book two. We've given lectures on all of those great poems. That Trojan horse with a thousand men in his belly, introduced by mercenary Greeks, exclamation point. He's back again, railing against the capitalist mentality that will tear down um, what is it, tear down a forest to put in a, a mall in a parking lot for the mall? Where is the country's champion? And obviously this is a rhetorical question. He thinks probably of himself as that. Where is the country's champion? The Moor of Moor Hall to meet him at the deep cut and thrust an avenging lance between the ribs of the bloated pest? Uh, this is a fascinating question. In other words, who's going to stand to represent the trees? Right? Again, our ecology movement is born in lines such as these. He says it all but this way. Nevertheless, of all the characters I've known, perhaps Walden wears best and best preserves its purity. Many men have likened to it, but few deserve that honor. And then he, a few lines later, says, Why, here is Walden, the same woodland lake that I discovered so many years ago. When a forest was cut down last winter, another is springing up by its shore as lustily as ever. The same thought is welling up to its surface that was then. It is the same liquid joy and happiness to itself that its might, that its maker, I, and it may be to me. It's the work of a brave man, surely, in whom there was no guile. He rounded into this water with his hand, deepened and clarified it in his thought, and in his will bequeathed it to Concord. I see by its face that it's visited by the same reflection, and I can almost say, Walden, is it you? And then he has a little poem in the middle of a poem. It's no dream of mine to ornament a line. I cannot come nearer to God in heaven than I live to Walden even. I am at stony shore and the breeze that passes o'er. In the hollow of my hand are its water and its sand and its deepest resort lies high in my thought. Beautiful poetry. We then will have other ponds to discuss, and in this case, Flint's Pond. And this is one of those great moments when Thoreau is able to unleash and he will say, Flint? Who was Flint to have named a pond after himself? Flint's pond. Such is the poverty of our nomenclature. What right had the unclean and stupid farmer whose farm abutted on the sky water, whose shore he has ruthlessly laid bare, to give his name to it? Some skin flint who loved better the reflecting surface of a dollar or a bright scent in which he could see his own brazen face, who regarded even the wild ducks which settled in it as trespassers, his fingers grown into crooked and horny talons from the long habit of grasping harpy-like, so it is not named for me. I go not there to see him, flint that is to say, nor to hear of him who never saw it, who never bathed in it, who never loved it, who never protected it, who never spoke a good word for it, nor thanked God that he had made it. Rather, let it be named from the fishes that swim in it, the wild fowl or quadrupeds which frequent it, the wild flowers which grow by its shores, or some wild man or child, the thread of whose history is interwoven with his own. Not from him who could show no title to it, but the deed which a like-minded neighbor or legislature gave him. I mean, this is Edward Abbey, isn't it? Beautiful stuff, right? Him who thought only of its money value, whose presence perchance cursed all the shore, who exhausted the land around it and would fain have exhausted the waters within it, who regretted only that it was not English hay or cranberry meadow. There was nothing to redeem it. Forsooth in his eyes and would have drained and sold it for the mud at its bottom. It did not turn his mill, and it was no, and it was no uh, privilege to him to behold it. I respect not his labors, his farm where everything has its price. Who could carry the landscape? Who would, care, who, who would carry his God to market if he could get anything for him? 
who goes to market for his God as it is, on whose farm nothing grows free, whose fields bear no crops, whose meadows no flowers, whose trees no fruits but dollars, who loves not the beauty of his fruits, but fruits are not right for him till they are turned to dollars. Give me the poverty that enjoys true wealth. Farmers are respectable and interesting to me in proportion as they are poor. Poor farmers, a model farm, where the house stands like a fungus in a muck heap. Chambers of men, horses, oxen, and swine, cleansed and uncleansed, all contiguous to one another. Stocked with men, a great grease spot, redolent of manures and buttermilk, under a high stake of cultivation being manured with the hearts and brains of men, as if you, could, as if you were to raise your potatoes in the churchyard. Such is a model farm. No, no. If the famous features of the landscape are to be named after men, let them be the noblest and worthiest of men alone. Let our lakes receive as true names, at least as the Iberian Sea, where still the shore, a brave attempt, resounds. Well, we would say, of course, that this is maybe one more reason to call Walden Pond the Rose Pond. He finishes by talking about White Pond and Walden. White Pond and Walden are great crystals on the surface of the earth, lakes of light. If they were permanently congealed and small enough to be clutched, they would perchance be carried off by slaves like precious stones to adorn the heads of emperors. But being liquid and ample and secure to us and our successors forever, it's tragic that he says forever, right? We disregard them and run after the diamond of Kohonra. They are too pure to have a market value. They contain no muck. How much more beautiful than our lives? How much more transparent than our characters are they? And then again, the exclamation point. We never learned meanness of them. How much fairer than the pool before the farmer's door in which his ducks swim? Hither the clean, wild ducks come. Nature has no human inhabitant who appreciates her. The birds with their plumage and their notes are in harmony with the flowers. But what youth or maiden conspires with the wild, luxuriant beauty of nature. She flourishes most alone, far from the towns where they reside. Talk of heaven! Exclamation point. Ye disgrace earth. Well, this is brilliant stuff, and, and I hope that you are challenged to go back and to read all of uh, this chapter. We'll turn now to Baker Farm in our chapter number 10 as we move forward. I hope that this study is challenging you to look again at the beauties of nature. Thank you, Thoreau.